Is everybody else having the same problem? I noticed that uh, I don't yes, see. Yes, I am. Yeah, no I'm getting the same. Here. Yeah, I'm that's correct. Same. It says you cannot start the video because the host has stopped it. Okay. Oh. So Joe, go under um, where it says your video on the bottom and do video settings. And I think as the host, you can allow us to all have them on. Oh, okay. That's why we have Valerie here. Yeah, that's great. And I took a shower for you people. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Um, okay, let me look. I got to find that. In the meantime, Darren and Valerie, hi. Uh, this is Dan Aaron. Um, technical uh, uh, problems and so I'm on telephone too and no video. Uh, probably not going to change for me. Nice to meet you. <laughs> that's, that's great, Dan. Actually, it's kind of interesting. Uh, people that usually call in only have their phone numbers, but I see the, the name Heron there. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I, I was able to do that manually. Unlike, I haven't been able to find the setting that uh, Valerie was telling us about. Hmm. Valerie, do you have a little red uh, microphone with an X on it on your screen? Yeah, I have my microphone has an X or not now because it's unmuted, but my video has the slash through. Okay. I'm just trying to remember when I've run Zoom meetings how to it's the person that sets it up is the one that controls who has video or not. Uh. And since we're doing a big uh, strategic plan, I think it probably is best for us to see each other. So Joe, the other thing, if you go down to participants and click on participants, it pulls up a page on the right-hand side of the screen. And it's got all the names and videos and microphones and cameras. Does it allow you to manually click on any of those? Oh, there we go. Fernando to the rescue. Uh, if I can get the stupid a box pops up. I can get that. Uh, 
Okay, I gotta get the blue boxes to mute or more to stop popping up in front of us here. Oh, I gotta let, no, it's determined to do that. And then the more doesn't say uh, turn on video. Ah, I think I found it. Hopefully. Can you guys try your video now? Autumn there. Hi, Autumn. Dan Hi. here. Oh, there we go. There we go. I see Autumn now. Hello. Okay, I think that fixed it. You yeah, might, whatever you guys fine. did. Sorry about that. Uh, no, forget it. You haven't fixed it by now, then I'm not going on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, okay. Here we are, all fixed up. Let's yep. uh, call this meeting to order and uh, conduct a roll call. Okay, that was one thing I wanted to mention. You, you're going to have to put up with me doing it because, uh, yeah, um, Nicole, something came up with her father, the health emergency, so she can't be here tonight. She was planning on it until a couple hours ago. So let's uh, go with uh, Director Short. I'm here. Uh, Director Roberts. Here. Director Stricky. Here. Director Altman. Welcome. Here. And um, who am I forgetting? I think that's all our board members. Oh, Bo, uh, Bo's not here yet. I don't I, see I him. think that's I think that's probably all we're gonna get for tonight because we have a I, meeting. So oh okay. Okay, so Bo might not be all right. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll conduct our Pledge of Allegiance if you follow me. I see Ray has a flag in his background. Thank you, Ray, for that. No problem. Would with me salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Darren. I'd like to welcome Ray Altman. Congratulations on your appointment to the city council. Thank you and, very much. Uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy your appointment to Redwood Coast Transit Authority. So, Joe, uh, you've got the floor. All right. Let me uh, share my screen with the agenda, and then we will get started. Joe, while you're going uh, through things, this is Dan, and I'll take some notes. Okay, sounds good. Appreciate that. I got too many windows open. There we go. I had, I closed most of them, but apparently not all. Okay, can you guys see my screen? This is just our agenda. So we are at the public comment phase and uh, I've received none from the county IT. So I believe that means we got none because it, it needs to, to go in before the meeting. I Is apologize, Joe. You're you're absolutely right. I, I totally skipped over public comment. I appreciate your correction on that. No worries. Um, so we uh, item four. Uh, Autumn Luna is going to lead this item for you guys. Um, Autumn, you want to give them a little background history? Sure. Uh, for Ray and Darren, this is the front end of the thing we just did in our DNLTC meeting where we uh, entered into another five-year contract with Tamara Layton. Uh, this is the first part of that process, which is to um, authorize the issuance of a request for proposals. Um, this request for proposals draft is actually uh, something that Martha Rice drafted prior to her leaving our CTA. Um, now that I'm looking at it, I, I haven't had a chance really to look at it in depth. Um, in fact, the Board of Supervisors is still going to approve the, the contract with RCTA at next week's meeting. That didn't go on in March for various reasons. Um, so what I'd actually like to do is have you authorize me today 
um, to make a couple of edits here, um, mostly just a few uh, minor issues about uh, addresses, who I am, for example, it says I'm the district attorney, which is absolutely not true. <laughs> very, very minor edits, uh, maybe a couple of things with the timeline to um, account for the fact that I'm gonna issue this on April 13th, not April 6th. Um, we do have a little bit of extra time in there. I know that uh, you know we've got we've got TMTP. Uh, their contract is coming up at the end of the fiscal year, and so that's why we're doing this now. We've got to put this out for um, requests for proposals to receive uh, proposals from whoever's interested. Make sure we're getting the best uh, quality uh, possible out there. And um, we like to get this done a little bit earlier, but because of the transition in, in attorneys, the timeline is going to be a little bit tight, but I think we're going to make it if we issue April 13th, uh, maybe close on April 30th. And then uh, the timeline as proposed later on in the in the uh, RFP here will probably work out. We may we may go out to June before we have something in place as far as a contract, and that really depends on how many proposals we get. So, um, anyways, I, I think that many of you have been through similar processes before. Our our executive directors at these uh, smaller agencies are often contracted positions. They're not uh, they're not staff members. And so this is a process we go through periodically required by um, local procedures manuals and, and often by our funding sources such as Caltrans in, in this case, uh, or in DNLTC's case. Um, so that's why we're doing this. Um, I am, I think we've done this with uh, RCTA now this is maybe the third time I've been a part of this, and I think as many times with DNLTC as well. So um, I will walk you guys through the process as, as we go forward, but this is just the very first step authorizing the issuance here. And then you know, further steps will come as we get proposals, depending on how many we get, we may go through uh, an interview process and ultimately ending in uh, June, probably more likely June timeline for uh, an approved agreement with a, a executive director services contract. So um, aside from the few adjustments that I'm going to make here, because there's a uh, not sure where, <laughs> where the idea that I'm the district attorney came from, that's, that's not true. Um, but aside from those few fixes, uh, does the board have any questions or comments about this RFP? So, I, Autumn, I have to apologize. I was talking to, to Bo via text. He's gonna be here in probably within 10 minutes. Um, right at the beginning of, of your talk, you asked for us to approve you to make minor changes to the RFP, of, of course, you not being a district attorney anymore. And there were- Never there were was, things. actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it, do, do you, are you suggesting that we need to make a motion to um, allow you to do that? Or is there is that necessary? Or we just need consensus? Or what is your opinion on that? The item number authorized the release of the RFP. I don't think that you need to give me specific direction to, to make modifications. I think that's implied. You're giving me the authorization to issue an RFP. It will be substantially in this form. Um, minor, minor alterations to this are not substantial. You don't need to modify the, the item as listed. That sounds completely reasonable. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because I was distracted. I certainly apologize for that, but I just wanted nope. to make sure we were perfectly clear. No problem. I'm going to admit, Darren, that my uh, presentation of this item was more or less rambling, so I don't think you missed <laughs> that much. <laughs> okay, so we go from here. We um, 
are you you're asking us to um you do you need a motion for the it's, submission of the rfp Is let's that, go ahead and, let's go ahead and do that we'll, we'll motion and second and then take a you know take a vote so I'll motion that we authorize the release of the RCTA general manager request for proposals after minor alterations conducted by county council. I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Starkey. And I'm sorry, who was the second? Ray Altman. Ray, thank you. Thank you, Ray. Is, no problem. is, there, is there any public comment? Or is there any public? <laughs> Do we have any public comment on this item? Nothing I'm aware of, Chair. Mr. Not, not any, Joe. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, we'll, uh, can we pull the vote? Uh, Chairman Short? Yes. Uh, Director Starkey? Yes. Director Altman? Yes. Director uh, Roberts? Yes. And Director Smith? I don't think Bo is, okay. Bo is not quite made it yet. All right, so I will see you guys again on May 4th uh, with proposals and we will go from there. Sounds good. Thank okay. you very much, Autumn. Thanks a lot, you guys. Thank you, Autumn. All right, Joe, if we can move right along to the annual workshop. That sounds good, thank you, Darren. Um, scroll through here. Don't look too close. It might be dizzying. Okay. Um, so the workshop, this is, uh, as I mentioned to some folks, this is like the funnest uh, meeting of the year for, for some of us, because we really get to kind of go into, into the weeds and talk about um, details of items and big picture stuff that normally we're dealing with like one item at a time and a little bit of background that goes with each one. So um, we have Dan Heron and I are going to We'll uh, tag team on this. This first item is mostly about the history with the special focus. Much of it, we don't even know the history that well of the early days of the agency. So we'll mostly focus on the last couple, three years. But we do, uh, we were able to uncover some stuff. Um, and then Dan's going to do the second presentation, which is about the budget and the finances. Not that this isn't, but that second one really focuses on budget. And then the third presentation will be where. Um, uh, I'll come back on and we'll be talking about service planning for the summer. We usually do our service changes at least once a year and it's usually in the summer. That's either late summer or midsummer. Um, and then we'll, have, we'll talk about that and then we'll introduce you to Sylvia Martinez Palacios, which is the newest member of our um, Heron TMTP admin team. We're really excited. She's a marketing ace that we've worked with before and she will show you a couple of our new social media sites. And then we'll finish last with a real quick um, couple, if we if time allows, we'll talk real briefly about the upcoming maintenance and operations contract, which is the big one uh, with First Transit that basically delivers a service for us. So any questions before we start? Um, one thing I was thinking is we, uh, what is the board preference? Do you wanna ask questions um, in real time and stop or should we go through each set and then do questions? What, what do you prefer? What's your preference? I prefer the real time, but uh, you know, it, it, but that's just my preference. I also prefer the real time. It keeps everything in context. I, I do appreciate the real time question. Sounds good. Let's do that then. Okay, so RCTA, let's see. I wanna make sure we get just the right amount of Zoom so you guys can read and we can still have one slide. Okay, that looks pretty good. Can you guys see it? Yeah. My texts are notoriously, infamously texty and D Dan Heron hates them. But it is how I do business. So yeah, I apologize. Um, ultimately, you'll get a chance to decide my fate in a month. But anyway, these are good, the- Good job, the, Dan. Keep, put, keep putting the pressure on Joe. <laughs> I will. Like, no more words, he says. It's not just the, uh, what's that great song by Berlin? No more words. Anyway, so um, the history of RCTA, we were launched in 2004. So it's a young agency. Um, created as a joint powers authority from the city and the county. That's why there's two of you board members from the city and two from the county. And then a fifth at large member, which is Ms. Fidette Roberts. Um, the model is a, a, a fully privatized agency. So everybody besides 
the contract that, that Dan, Sylvie, and I work under. Every, everyone else is under one large contract with, that's held by First Transit right now to provide all the day-to-day -day operations and maintenance. And then we're under a separate contract to provide basically all the agency work, which is your planning, your budgeting, your capital projects, marketing, that sort of thing. Uh, service began officially as RCT in 2004, as did the construction of the MNO facility, the maintenance and operations facility, which is on the north end of the fairgrounds property. Uh, the early days of RCTA, um, we were very dial a ride centered in the early days. I was able to dig that out of the stats. Um, and uh, a lot, uh, an impact of that is 40% of our total passengers were dial a ride passengers in the early days. That was in 2004. Uh, and a third of our hours. That compares to today where just 5% of the, 5.5% five of the passengers and 10% of the hours are dial a ride. So as, as, and this is pretty normal in transit, as the system evolved, more fixed route was delivered and consumed and less dial a ride. The size of the agency has been about steady uh, until the COVID hit. We're going to, we're going to, talk about that plenty as we go on, but we used to provide about 20,000 annual revenue hours per year for many years. That's fluctuated, it, it fluctuated and floated around, but that was about the average. Um, our peak ridership, so I guess you could say the heyday of RCTA as far as from a pure ridership number was fiscal year 11, 12, where we had 154,000 annual boardings. Um, the ridership dropped sharply just a year a year after that, and the decline was fairly steady, so down to 100,000 in fiscal year 17-18. Um, UREC Tribal Transit Service was launched initially in 09 and then expanded in 2013 to include a daily route that basically mirrored our Route 10, and that route rider shift we never really did recover from. Um, recent history, which we know more about. Um, I've been, Dan and I have been around since what, April 2016. Uh, in 2016, one of the first things we did when we, took, when we took on the project is we did a detailed analysis of how our service operated. Um, On-time performance was very bad. Uh, and then there was no technology. So we come up with, with some plans to improve things. We streamlined our fixed routes in, Crescent, in and around Crescent City and the regional ones as well. But the, the the improvements were most noteworthy in town where we've seen an increase from about 60% on-time performance to about 80 today. Um, and even that number, I think it's actually a little better than that, but our, our AVL is limited on how it calculates the time points. So um, that's what it's showing. So that's what we'll go with. Um, we did that through, uh, we no longer went through parking lots and and dealt with traffic and potential risk of doing that. We, we So basically we streamlined the routes to keep the bus moving more and sitting less. Uh, and what that did is that, that allowed our routes, which are 30 minute cycles, the local routes, one, two, three, and four, they're also color coded, um, but those run in 30 minute cycles. And at the time, what we found when we did the analysis in 16 is the routes were barely getting back to cultural center, which is where they start. They're barely getting back in time to do the next route. So drivers were never getting a break unless they just uh, stopped the bus to go to the bathroom and then the route became very late. So it wasn't very drivable, if you see that word drivability. Um, so ridership did rebound after that in 1819 and uh, we gained 10% over the prior year and we were doing about as well in, in 1920 when the COVID hit in February or March of 2020. Um, we've had sudden loss of ridership uh, of over half and it hasn't really come back yet. Uh, although it could start to. Um, we cut, third, we proactively, the board met in early April last year. So about a year ago to the date almost and, and proactively reduced 33% of our service of the least productive service, of course. Uh, and that hasn't been reinstated. So we're gonna talk more about that later. Um, this next so slide shows our uh, top graph is our system-wide ridership the last 10 years. So you see that great year we had in 11-12 and then kind of a slow decline after that, then a little rebound, then the COVID. We would have ended up probably right up near last year, but the COVID hit, took the last three, four months and just crushed us last year. Um, the annual revenue hours, which is how much bus service we're putting out, pretty steady. You saw it go up and down with economic factors. Um, we're gonna talk a little later about reserves, but in the old days, we didn't have much reserves. So if the economy started to slow or tank, we had to cut almost right away. So that was tough because we, we did, we, we saw a little bit of waves there 
Um, but it's been pretty steady the last three years. It would have been up, and to note, it would have been up last year in the 19,000 range had we not did those cuts in early April. So the, the fourth quarter was less and it ended up bringing us about even with the two prior years. Um, what's the COVID done to the agency? Um, well, it hasn't been good, that's for sure. Um, in April 2020, how we reacted, we've done a number of things to, to fight the pandemic and try to ensure as safe as environment for passengers and employees as possible. We added a third party cleaning contract to come in every night and deep clean the buses starting a year ago from now. Um, and this contract still effect, in effect, we actually adjusted what they do just this last week because we have some new technology on board. So we want them to do some, to do a little more hand cleaning and less fogging, uh, which is a spray that they were using. Um, we designed our in-house, uh, thanks to Nick West, he's our amazing maintenance manager, um, designed, purchased, and installed protective barriers inside all the buses to reduce driver exposure to the virus from passengers. Uh, we implemented a $2 an hour crisis pay for to retain drivers, and that's still in effect, and it's been very helpful. We uh, complied with the county health directives and limited capacity on board did no more than 10 people at a time. Still in effect. Um, although we were talking about, we might be able to loosen that up now. Um, just recently, so, so these uh, top four items that we just walked through were all implemented last spring, right in the heart of the pandemic. Um, just recently, because it took a while, we uh, added some high tech stuff. We applied an Aegis antimicrobial solution inside all the touch surfaces of the buses. Um, this is a topical that basically creates a virus unfriendly environment so that uh, it's less likely to spread through touch. Um, we ordered enough for about five years worth of this product. We, we did our application for this year and we got plenty more for the future. It, it's, it lasts about one year per application, even with intense cleaning going on. Um, we added air purifier units uh, to the buses, which are like you find in medical offices. They, uh, intake the, the, they intake air from inside the coach, zap it with UV rays to kill microbes and the coat, including the coronavirus. And then they also put out a, a small amount of hydrogen peroxide, which cleans the air uh, that's lingering inside the coach to give it an uh, extra effectiveness. Uh, and we added a few of those units to the operations facility, one in each room as well. So those have been, those are new. Since the last time we got together, board members, that is new. We got those installed a couple of weeks ago. Oh uh, yeah, it was in mid, mid to late March. Um, Prior to the uh, COVID, there's some things that we need to convey to you um, where we were just before the COVID hit. Um, we were facing pressure from inadequate capital funding. Um, and Dan's gonna go through the different alphabet soups of funding, but capital is for buying buses or fixing up the shop or improving bus stops. And that's an area where rural transit's really under, underfunded in this country and, and RCTA is no different. Uh, and we were also experiencing rising labor costs because the California minimum wage has been going up and we want to stay above that to attract top, top talent. So that's been causing upward pressure on our, on our labor costs. Um, we developed under what you would call like a maximum service hours model, um, just how the original administrator and board envisioned this. So our wages have always been around minimum wage, which has its own issues. Uh, and there was never enough money for capital projects. So the fleet at times has fallen behind in replacement and then the bus stops have been an area of concern for quite some time. Um, the projections on how to mitigate that was, and we'll talk in more detail later, but if we could set aside some of our operating money each year to, for these capital projects, then we would probably be in good shape. Um, but that just means we'll need to be smaller as far as annual service hours than we used to be. So we'll get into that more later. Um, why are capital projects important, especially bus maintenance? Because the, the older they get, um, the higher the maintenance costs and the more unreliable the service is, uh, especially with the kind of buses you see us use. Because you know, I know a lot of you have seen the, the urban buses that you see that cost like half a million bucks if you go to the city or Portland or anything. Those are out of our range because we, we don't have enough capital money. As I just mentioned, we can't even buy enough cutaways, which are what you see us using that kind of look like um, dial ride vehicles or airport shuttles, so to speak. So those are cheaper, but even that, we have not had enough capital money to main, they, they need to be replaced more often, which is a bummer. So every six years is our life cycle. 
Um, and that's a challenge for us right now with inadequate capital money to get them fixed. I mean, get them replaced at the six year mark. So often we're running them, you know, eight or nine years before we can replace them. Um, what do we use for money on this? I'm gonna skip through this pretty quick because it's Dan, it's more Dan's slide, but we, um, back in the old days under Governor Schwarzenegger in 2006, they did the Prop 1B bond measure to stimulate the economy. Uh, and we got 10 years worth of PTMISEA funding for that, which was dedicated to transit and limited to capital. So that was banked pretty well by Mark, my, uh, my, our predecessor. So we've been spending those funds down, but they're almost done. So th we, they expect to be expired within the next year. Um, the recent SB1 legislation of like three years ago um, provides a new funding source called State of Good Repair, but it's much smaller than PTMISEA. So we're getting about 42K a year out of that, which is not enough. I mean, it helps, but it's not nearly enough. Um, we really, and we're very lean, as, as you see, um, there's not a lot of uh, fat to cut, whether it be on the operation side or our contract. Um, so we, uh, we're gonna touch on more later, but we recommend that as we rebuild and as we think about reinstating service, we don't probably reinstate all the service that was cut during the pandemic because some of it wasn't producing very well. And we were, you know, we don't wanna put ourselves right back in that spot we were a year and a half ago where we were running so much service that we couldn't put aside any money to, to replace the buses or do bus stop. Um, we have a reserve account and that's, uh, basically built over the, we didn't really have much reserves five years ago, but now it's up around 350,000 and probably even more shortly at the end of this year when the audit happens for 2021, because we did cut service, I believe more than our funding got cut. So these reserves build when we don't spend as much money as the TDA fund brings in, uh, which is based on a statewide sales tax of a quarter cent on durable goods. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Joel, if you don't mind me, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, it appears that Bo is here in the attendees list, and I know you're in control of the meeting. So if you could let him in. Sounds good. Hold on. Let's do that. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, that's quite all right. I'm glad you did. Well, Joe is doing that. I can carry on a little bit. Uh, yeah, the TDA, uh, the, revenue, the reserves that Joe is talking about basically are built up by our sales tax money, we, uh, I'll get into it in a bit with uh, where the money comes from, but that's really been a boon to us, and uh, we want to, to see that going up. Um, the, uh, because that will uh, build our uh, reserves even further. Uh, one of the things we didn't mentioned when we were talking about the reserves is we used to have um, a federal source that could be used, that was used both for capital and operating it's called 5311f and that was cut 50 percent a number of years ago and we're just not going to get that again it's actually going uh, going to be very competitive year to year, and we, someday we could lose that totally. So we do need to, to continue building the, the reserves. Um, we've got to be uh, very sensitive, and the board certainly uh, needs to be too. We're not hoarding these reserves. These are, uh, we have a very volatile um, uh, ridership right now. We've got to uh, be nimble about the decisions we make and be able to spend that where it's needed to, to uh, continue the services. The optimal reserves that we're looking at, we would love to see around 600,000. Uh, that, some people see that as uh, very high. We see it as two buses. <laughs> so it could, it, we could uh, go through it very quickly if we had to. Um, Pre-COVID, um, and even now, the main tool for freeing up funds, we need to be, uh, uh, for capital, we need to uh, take a look at uh, restructuring and keeping the cost down uh, by making sure that we're serving the most productive routes. 
Yeah. Um, we have been using more one-time sources of capital. Uh, it, it takes a lot of um, uh, fundraising and uh, grant seeking, I should say, uh, to go after the the one-time only one. Uh, and a much more stable thing is things like our um, SB1 uh, funding uh, for uh, state of good repair, which we get about $42,000 a year on that. That helps quite a bit. Uh, COVID-19 and the service cuts uh, have been necessary. And we hope to rebuild RTCA looking at new lower service levels if we need to, to allow RTCA, RCTA to set aside uh, some money that we can use for capital projects and apply also to the rising labor costs that we expect. We're entering a, a situation of new contract. Uh, halfway through the next fiscal year, it could jump uh, uh, considerably uh, the operating uh, cost itself, which is our main uh, uh, outgo of the funding. Yeah, um, the, uh, the first transit contract makes up, what, 85% of our cost, Ben, of our budget? 85%, and then you plug two, uh, fuel on top of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. All right, thanks, Dan. That was excellent, Phil. Or we should we should be a broadcast team at the ballgames. That would be fun. Um, so yeah, I think we covered it. I'm going to move on. Um, we we will talk a little at the end of today's session about uh, the ops contract. But regardless of who's got the contract, they have to comply with minimum wage. And what we struggle with, and and the folks can first, from First Transit on the call can vouch for that is if we're right at minimum wage. Our drivers have lifestyle constraints and huge responsibilities for safety for our passengers um, that the rest of the service industry doesn't have. So we need to be a little above that to be to effectively retain top talent for this job. It's not, you know, you can make burritos for minimum wage at Taco Bell and you don't have a lot of responsibility. So we're competing against that. Nothing against Taco Bell. I love Taco Bell. Anyway. Um, so we touched on this. We'd like to maybe rebuild ourselves a little smaller than we were before the pandemic. We almost needed to make some cuts as it is, uh, and the pandemic just happened to come along, and here we are. Um, so I think we'll wrap. That, that was longer. Um, speaking to that, um, the focus kind of is the delta between what the current minimum wage is and what our RCTA uh, like entry-level employees make. So if we could stay, you know, one of the things that we want the board to think about is what's, what's the proper delta? What's the target um, between minimum wage and our drivers, um, considering, you know, the level of responsibility, the drug testing, everything they go through to drive for us that they wouldn't if they were just working any normal service job. So would it be minimum wage plus two bucks an hour, three, five? I mean, that's kind of what we want to get a feel from you guys for. Um, right now, it's all over the map, but it's probably closer to the minimum plus two or three, um, thanks to the crisis pay, which we want to continue. Um, but going in the future, what's the right level? So that's what we want you guys to think about. Um, minimum wage is at 13 bucks an hour still here in 2021. It's going to uh, increase a buck an hour next year and then up to 15 in 2023. Then at that point, it probably holds unless there's a, uh, additional legislative action and intervention. And it should be pointed out that our current contract is with uh, First Transit, and they have run lean all through the contract. Uh, we get an excellent uh, uh, level of service with uh, very little money. If you take a look at um, what it costs to run an operation in other places, of course, you've got a different labor market, but many of the places are paying in the 20s an hour for, uh, for somebody who drives the bus. A lot of responsibilities. Yeah, and we're, that's a good point, Dan. And we're, we're lean in every level, basically. So if you look at our, and we'll, we'll present this to you guys, not today, but um, probably when we get into the contract uh, stage, um, whether it's an extension or, or 
or a new deal with, with a, a contractor, you'll see that our fully loaded costs are about the lowest in the state. So D Dan speaks the truth between our part-time ad administration that tries to do full-time job and then the Halloween first transit is and on the op side of our equation, we're very lean. Um, so what has the COVID done to the ridership? We touched on this. Uh, it's down 50 to 60%, and then it's held pretty steady. So this, the loss was sudden last spring, and the recovery has just been flat. So folks have been using the bus for critical errands, but not to the level they were before. Hey, Joe, um, uh, if, if I could just chime in on that last slide, if you want input <laughs> from, from this group. Um, sure. I know talking to employers that uh, employ truck drivers, they're having a very, very hard time finding competent employees, people who can pass a drug test. Um, and I, along those same lines, I think that we should look at um, our price structure for our drivers that would attract them and, um, you know, attract the, the type of driver that we want that's, that's responsible for human life in their, in their driving practices. And, uh, and that will uh, continue to, uh, excuse me, continue to meet those standards of, you know, being able to pass a drug test on a regular basis and, uh, and stay clean and, and do a good job for us. I, I know in the past, uh, as an RCTA um, board member, I, I think there was a few times where there was just enough drivers and, um, you know, probably uh, if, if my memory serves me correctly, the majority of the time you had somebody uh, as a backup, but there were other times where we were pretty lean at RCTA and, uh, and, uh, as, as, the, as drivers go. So um, I don't know if you were looking for input from, the, from this group as to whether you want minimum wage plus two, plus three, plus five, but, um, you know, as budgets permit, I, I mean, that seems to be the, the place where we need to encourage our most competent employees. So um, I, I don't know if anybody else has any uh, desire to, to comment on this or if you were hoping for comments on that particular item. I, I, I definitely was. Yeah, I'd love to hear from more of the board members because we have had so much board turnover the last board was very much behind uh, operator wages, staff wages going up to stay above minimum. But with the new board, I wanted to touch on this today during the workshop to make sure that the staff's not sideways with you guys. Well, I, I completely agree that we really have to look at this because in your comparison with a fast food restaurant and driving a bus that right now only holds 10 passengers, but upwards of, of 20 passengers could ride that bus. That's a huge responsibility. I mean, I don't even like to drive carpool vans with kids in it sometimes because it's a huge responsibility. And those passengers are, are you know, your responsibility. Um, my, I was just looking up though, I think wages are $14 an hour currently. And, and how many employees do you guys have again? Less than 25? We currently have 11. Oh, for okay, so maybe it's because 25 and above, I think it's $14 an hour, and then that bumps to 15 next year. So it's possible that you're still at the 13 level. Um, but I would like it to be very attractive because I, I think that we should be attracting the most qualified people. Um, if we're gonna make this a community you know, service, I, I really wanna make sure that we get the, the um, optimal candidates for this job. How many, how many passengers, are, are they commercial drivers? Are the drivers commercial? Yeah, all of our drivers have a class B driver's class. license. So they have to go, there's, okay, I, I'm a commercial driver as well. And there's a lot that goes into getting that. Yeah. It's just not go to the DMV and get it. So I, I'm with, with Mr. Short on that and Ms. Starkey. We and do but also with the commercial B, who's paying for that training that goes into that? Because it's my understanding that you have to go through a significant amount of courses or training, correct? 
And does the does this agency pay for that, or is, do they need to come with you, come to you prepared to have already had that? First Transit is covering the cost of the training currently. Right. So if the wages could go up, that would attract. Do you think that would attract already trained drivers? I think it would. And that makes it a lot easier on our team because they can get the operator training in the seat so much faster uh, than if they have to train from scratch. Right, right, Fernando? That is correct. Any other thoughts on the, the wages? It's so I'm so glad to hear that, that you guys see see the picture. Yeah. My, my other thing, so 11 bus drivers or 11 total employees at the transit station? Well, currently we have... 11 employees, all employees are required to have a CDL. So everyone at this facility can drive behind the wheel, including our maintenance manager. So, but we currently have seven full-time drivers that are doing the routes. Okay, thank you. I'm also in agreement. Thank you. Okay, um, let's wrap this up. This was an excellent uh, conversation. I don't think we need to go through this last slide. It was kind of basically more highlighting the case for having a, a little bit of a Delta above minimum wage so we can attract and retain the top talent, even if it means providing a little less service. Um, for example, some of the services we cut last April were screaming to be cut. <laughs> They were suicidal. They, uh, we were riding like one and two people per hour, which is horrifically low productivity. So you know, it's not like we cut a lot of high productive service. The Saturdays is probably the toughest one. And we'll talk about that later. That's one I'd like to reinstate as soon as we could. But yeah, that's basically that one. Uh, next up, we have Dan Heron, who uh, bailed me out for that bridge during the first presentation. He's going to take the point on this one where we talk about those funding sources more and our current budget and budget for next year. Dan, are you ready? Yeah, I am. Um, All right, I'll, I'll do the slides for you. Let me know okay. when you want to switch. I've got it on the first one with the, the colorful chart. That's it. Um, what you see in front of you is kind of typical. Um, Pre-COVID, I should point out, all of the years selected here are pre-COVID, but it shows where the money comes from. Our money, comes from local funds, and that's basically a local sales tax that goes to Sacramento and comes back to us. The first two clusters here, the ones that say LTF, local, local uh, transit fund, and STA, state transit assistance, are in that category. They're sales tax, and therefore, uh, when we have a COVID uh, problem uh, uh, with the economy, uh, that's going to affect those. The other two, you can see fairly stable on uh, 5311. Uh, uh, that is a federal funding source. We pretty much get that every year, but it's still one of our uh, lesser funds. Uh, the 5311F, we, uh, we mentioned it went down, plummeted as more people uh, were applying. It got more competitive. Uh, it's been holding here a couple of years at about the same level. Uh, we will just have to um, be competitive, um, our go around for the next uh, funding year. If you can go to the next slide in particular, uh, it's, it's important to point out that the, the TDA is our main funding source, and it's probably about 5% a year. I did an analysis of it one time, and uh, TDA over longer periods of time has shown an exact five-year increase because it's uh, attached to, to uh, California's economy, which may waver up and down, but it's uh, always been a little better over time. Uh, the COVID impacts, uh, you know, we're, we're not 100% sure. We're kind of predicting 27% decrease 
uh, because of COVID. Uh, there's some reasons it's unclear, but uh, uh, definitely uh, the revenues that generate the sales tax have been down for the county. Um, and um, uh, the 5311, those are sales tax. Now we, you see where FTA stands for Federal Transit Act or Federal Transit Administration. That means it comes from Washington. FTA 5311 is pretty much a formula grant, so it's steady. It's been steady. We hope it continues to be steady every year. 5311F, the next one, is the one that kind of bounces around, could be zero any year that we apply for it because the com competition is really stiff. Uh, 50, uh, uh, one of the brightest things is uh, FTA 5339 because it comes out about one bus a year. It is competitive, but we're good competitors, and uh, that has has been pretty much about the same level. Sometimes you get two, which is good, but uh, we could get uh, theoretically we could get a year with on, only one or none. Uh, but that's a federal source that happens to be administered here through Caltrans. If money comes to Caltrans, and they administer it. Some of the other places money comes in is grant sources. A thing called LCTOP is our low carbon transit op, uh, optimizing program. And that's uh, 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 money that uh, comes to help clean our air. So all of the projects under that uh, have to be competitive, and we have to show uh, corresponding uh, air quality uh, change. But we were rather surprised that uh, that comes from a different revenue source, but was cut uh, considerably uh, for 2021. We don't know if that means it's going to bounce up there, but uh, again afterwards. But it is a year-to-year -year basis, and. We're talking uh, anything from 12,000 at one time up to 52,000, and that's been uh, for us uh, dedicated to a lot of different things that clean the air. Uh, the fares and advertising revenues is really uh, uh, showing us that it's been succeeding over the years. We think it might be capable of 22000 a year. It probably costs us uh, le less than $10,000. It's shown that it costs us less than 10000 to generate that income. Uh, but that's fairly clean money coming in. The FTA uh, 5310 is brand new. We uh, had to compete for it, but we uh, we'll, we have been approved to get two buses, uh, and we'll do that uh, probably this year. COVID relief has been a surprise. It's been really a uh, relief uh, because that is kind of one time, but it's going to cover all of our losses to, that we can demonstrate were caused by COVID-19. Now, that means sales tax, That because it uh, drops the uh, uh, revenue. If we can show that our revenue dropped because of COVID, we can apply for that money back and backfill our TDA money. We can show that we've been damaged by COVID on the fares, uh, down a third on our uh, dollars there. We can backfill that completely with COVID expenses, 100% no requirement for a matching fund. So basically, COVID has uh, been very good about handling not just our cleaning and our sanitizing of the buses and the air in the buses, uh, but also basically the uh, 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 handling uh, the uh, 
uh, costs and the, the fair revenue that we didn't uh, didn't anticipate. Dan, can yeah, I jump so in I, while we're on this slide? I had a, a couple of things to highlight for the group. Um, so these are the sources that's pretty much lays them all out, but the board, the newer board members, especially might be wondering, okay, well, where does each of these go? What do we spend it on? So I wanted to take maybe two minutes to talk about that. So the first one is the biggest one, as it said, it's our main funding source in the range of 500 to 700,000 a year, which is a lot. Remember our operating budget's only like a little over a million. So this, uh, this is huge. And we, so this is spent, in fact, these first one, two, these first four, so TDA, LTF, TDA, STA, FTA 5311 and FTA 5311F have been used for operations by RCTA since before uh, Dan and I came along. So for many, many, many moves. Then the FTA 5339, as Dan said, is for capital only. So that one's, and we just started getting that in the last few years. Um, the LC top can be for capital or operating. Initially, we, we used it for capital for some bus shelters about five years ago. And then we started using it for our students ride free program for three years. And then Caltrans said, no, nah, you can't do that no more. We want another project. So these last two years, we're, we're using it for our new elect bus uh, fleet electrification project which is going to bring the first all electric buses to our CTA. They're not here yet. We're still in the planning phase, but we're allowed to bank it and spend it all at once. So I anticipate that even next year, we'll have a third year of this at least because that project's not funded yet. Um, but that's what that's for. This one could, could go back to operations, but Caltrans is funny. They don't want it to go for more than about three years to any operating project, which is so bizarre. I mean, don't get me started on Caltrans, but anyway, that's what that is. The fares and ad revenues were basically, as Dan said, that's clean money that's being used mostly to, to generate more marketing with. The 5310 is also a capital one. So it probably, it's down here because it's new. We wanted to highlight it for you, but it could move up right here because it's similar to FTA 5339. We're using it for bus replacement. Okay, Dan, Good sorry point. to throw that in there. <laughs> I wanted yeah. to just, I wanted to ask okay. a really quick question. Um, um, on the FTA 5339, just I think my understanding of that was it's the main bus replacement fund, but Caltrans kind of sets how much they're going to say that bus will cost and any increases that we want to do to that or any additions that comes out of the general fund. Is that correct? It's absolutely correct. Thank you, Val. I just um, wanted Ray to know that because that was something that was shocking to me and I just didn't want to think, oh, we've got this magic bus fund when that's not necessarily entirely true. Yeah. Good, good right. point. And a good example of the specifics of how that hurts us is they they fund us to what the level of like the cheapest cutaway would, would have with no head sign, no bike racks, high floors, what are difficult for the seniors and elderly and the disabled. And that they give us that much money. It's like, hey, take it or leave it. Here you go, uh, have fun. So we want a better bus than that. So we, we, we are trying to get all low floor cutaways, which are easier to board and alight, safer, uh, much better for the Crescent City local routes. But those cost like almost half again as much as the ones that they fund. So each time we do that, we have to overmatch, which means we have to dig into our general fund, as Valerie said, uh, for extra money because they're only giving us enough for like the cheapest level cutaway. Good Thank point. You for that up. Next slide. Hi, Dan. Sorry to interrupt you. No problem. Next slide. Okay, we talked about the money, where the money came came from, and how it comes in and is used. Um, let's take a look at how we spend it. Well, surprising. It's not surprising at all. We spend it on transit uh, service, basically the contract that runs the bus uh, through First Transit, an excellent uh, provider. That pays for the maintenance, operation support, bus drivers' uh, wages, supervision, and so on. Um, and that's about 85% of our uh, budget. When you add another 10% for the fuel, most of the money goes into to providing the wheels on the road and the uh, passengers inside the bus. Um, 
administration is, is fairly light for this, uh, uh, fairly lean. Uh, loss of peer transit agencies we've looked at. Um, the, uh, uh, but you can say that also of the, the uh, service operations. We should probably be expecting when we get another contract, whether it be first uh, transit or some other transit operator, um, that uh, costs ha are probably going to go up. It's a, really a fairly lean contract. Both contracts are fairly lean. Um, but we've got the uh, reserve fund. This is roughly half a million. We're probably talking more around 400000 but we will see when the audit comes in. Uh, you can take a look at uh, the next slide kind of shows uh, currently. Where are we at today on spend expenditures? A lot of people would like to uh, be able to look at uh, the expenditures and how they're running through the year. So this chart shows us each of the expenditure categories that we, uh, that we watch and maintain, and it shows the budget for 2021 is the first column there. Uh, the second column is year to date, um, uh, the first seven months of this fiscal year. And if you look at the the first the top yellow there, uh, the current percentage of the budget year is 58 percent. How do you get that? Seven months divided by 12. So we're 58 percent through uh, the funding year, and these are the numbers. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, column that says year to date, the numbers under it our dollars expended so far in the seven months. And uh, the last column shows, okay, if we spent 5,170, how much of that, uh, uh, how much of our uh, audit, uh, of our budgeted 8,200 have we expended? Well, we expended 63%. Uh, CTS marketing expense. Uh, yeah, CT. Uh, all of the rest of them uh, are the same. Basically, if it's under 58 percent, we're not really uh, spending it exactly as uh, per month. There, uh, there may be some fluctuations in billing and so on, but uh, you can see it's pretty much healthy all the way down on the budget, um, uh, the percent of the budget year, all of those percents uh, average 44 percent, whereas we're 58 uh, percent through the, uh, the funding year. And so we're pretty in pretty good shape uh, with that. Um, we could definitely always uh, if, uh, use more. If you take a look at the the center bulge there, uh, where we're talking uh, $312 expended this year to date on legal services. If we look down at, wait, wait a minute, that's how does that relate to 250000 on running the buses? Well, uh, the next slide will show this, but that middle ground right there, uh, you see the two tallest uh, uh, green columns are your budgeted amount, and right next to it in the purple is uh, year to date. So our budget, we're, we're, still, we're doing pretty good on everything, uh, maintaining uh, or uh, below our uh, fiscal year at, at this particular thing. But you can definitely see there where the bulge is. Uh, it's going to services, and that's very appropriate. Anyone got questions with those? Where the money is going? Okay, we'll um, go to the issues that we should probably touch on as we're going through there. Um, generally, we're on or under the budget to date. 
fuel costs were fairly well under. Uh, uh, you might consider lowering, lowering the budgeted amount, but that's been a buffer for quite some time. Uh, we needed it at one t point when the fuel costs got absolutely ridiculous. Uh, so we, in future budgets, we're probably still going to be suggesting to you that that's a pretty good buffer to keep. Advertising program really has been a success. Let's continue to uh, put some money in it because we get good things back uh, out of it. It uh, improves Everything that we do it um, uh, improves the fare box stat statistics. We can plow that money back into advertising to continue that process. Operator costs uh, slightly raised every contract year, but at the end of a five-year contract, the operating costs, unless it's uh, extended for a year or two, uh, usually pops up pretty dramatically. Um, another thing that's quite interesting, uh, the uh, uh, local transportation commission uh, designated the uh, RCTA as a CTSA, another uh, acronym uh, that stands for uh, coordinated Transit Services Agency, in other words, someone who is charged with making sure that the transit is coordinated uh, with other nonprofit uh, services out there and is meeting the needs of the larger community. That may bring us, uh, depending on what our projects that uh, we need funded, uh, 25 to 30,000. Uh, the biggest uh, uh, issue that I see is COVID. Uh, COVID knocked us down and picked us up. And I want to kind of emphasize that. We really do have enough COVID funds to cover any hit that uh, we received from COVID and probably will for the next year or two. I do see some challenges in all this. Uh, one of them is uh, COVID money is uh, uh, abundant right now, if there are ways that we can use it to improve uh, or enhance the safety of all our tra uh, passengers, not just um, with uh, COVID germs out of the air, um, that makes sense. Uh, and if we can use it to enhance the transit experience, as general, generally we'd probably want to take a look at that. Monitors in the buses could advertise or remind people of the steps they still need to take in order to be safe from COVID, but uh, that may be a legitimate use for COVID dollars to purchase and install those that would uh, could be used for interesting kinds of uh, other projects and uh, uh, kind of an almost entertaining a uh, way to sell transit on, on the buses itself. Another challenge, of course, is uh, do we have to depend on one-time only funding, maybe, uh, for our electric buses? Uh, the electric buses cost a substantial amount more than the regular buses. Unfortunately, uh, the federal money, um, as pointed out by by Valerie, that does not cut it. That uh, stops at the basic bus. You want to add something like uh, technology to it or electric bus, sometimes it runs it up to twice uh, the cost of the bus for a quality product in the direction you want to move. Uh, so those are kind of the, the challenges. And uh, with that, I'll open it to any questions you have. Whoops, I guess we could uh, go to the conclusion before we open it up. Uh, the flexible funding that we've got that can be applied both to operating and capital uh, is, has been steady before this, um, and uh, we're, we're hopeful that it will get back to it. Capital um, 
funding sources are a little inadequate for some uses, and the COVID response costs will be covered by uh, the federal funding for uh, COVID relief. Budgeting for the next year, yeah, it's probably going to be a little drafty at first. We, we talked about a draft budget. Uh, we may need to remain nimble. We may need to uh, make some changes halfway through the operating year if we have a new contractor or an extension of the current contract at a higher price. But we can anticipate, hopefully, by then, that we'll have close to the 600000 that we would like to see in the, uh, uh, in the reserve budget, uh, the Valerie mentioned kind of general fund. We, we call it a reserve budget, but it's pretty much that. It's up to the board how to use it. Okay, with that, I, uh, I think I'm... Please, Dan. Good job. Yeah. So I have a couple questions or just I want to make sure that... Um, you know, has, have we looked at the California state relief that is coming out? that make sure that there's, if there's any transit money, I'm just kind of Google searching it real fast and um, just making sure that that funding that California is putting out that we're, we're grabbing whatever piece of the pie we can for that. I, I don't know if California is, uh, if, if California is using its own resources to do that, uh, I wouldn't know. Uh, Joe, you might no more than I. I do know about four different acts on the federal side that are going to feed COVID relief, and uh, that's substantial. Do, do you know if uh, the state of California is getting its fair share or uh, is poning up any money themselves for COVID relief or transit? Not that I'm aware of, but I'll keep an eye on it. I'm a member of the Cal Act Legislative Committee, so we get together about every other week for a, a Zoom call. So no, I haven't heard of any of that. I think it's mostly going to streets and roads relief for uh, local governments, which is yeah. uh, sorely needed as well. But I, I will keep an eye on that. I don't believe any of that's coming to transit, but if it does, I'll let you know. Okay, because I can I'll say, I can send a text to Senator McGuire too and just say, hey, is there any funding that, because we just had a meeting last week with him um, with regard to other things like, you know, individuals with licenses and different things that the, the state's waiving a bunch of fees. So I'll just see if there's anything that applies for this that we want to make sure that we grab at. That sounds great. That'd be real helpful. Thank you. Guys, open. Any other budget questions before we move into the service planning, kind of the third and last big one we're going to cover tonight? Uh, I just had one question. Go ahead, Ray. Um, so uh, by getting electric buses, does that uh, open you up for getting maybe like grant funding or some sort of extra funding from uh, state and federal government? Or um, is it because they sound like they're twice as expensive. Yes, they are. Um, if you'll let me answer that, Joe, the, okay. uh, we actually have three grant applications out now. Uh, we have uh, two applications for three bus uh, uh, that add up to three electric buses. Uh, one of them, at, at least, is a, a full yes or no. They'll either tell us no or they'll give us a full um, amount of the buses. Believe it or not, that is a uh, uh, Volkswagen mitigation fund, but it's fairly competitive too. So we may or may not get those funds. Um, but yes, uh, grants writing, grantsmanship is going to be really important because we are kind of under a mandate. Uh, it's actually a, a clean air uh, ruling from the uh, uh, state level that says uh, we will be purchasing down the road 25% uh, later years, higher percent of our buses have to be non-polluting buses, which in this area so far 
uh, everything we've looked at says electric buses. So we'll we'll have to deal with that at this point. Uh, there are some other funding resources, and we just have to be watching them and going after them every single time. Thank you. Yeah, actually, we're, we're going to talk at the last item of our day today is approval of a grant application that Dan's been working on just for that very thing, one of the three he was talking about. So we're going to mm -hmm. touch on that more at the end. Any other questions about the budget? Should we move on? All right, hearing none, let's roll into service planning 2021 and then marketing, which is always the funnest part. Um, so we touched on our ridership loss. How do we get these folks back? Um, and, then, and then how do we deal with the fact that we've received such robust um, assistance from the federal government that um, we don't, this time a year ago, we had no idea if and how much intervention the feds would come with us. You know, it was, it was a different place in time. So we made conservative decisions and went ahead and were proactive and cut service. But now a year later, we have received, you know, over a million in these one-time CARES Act. And I don't even know if I have the acronym right, but it's the new Biden stimulus. So, so yeah. it's a different world and we probably have more, I feel more pressure as your GM to reinstate some service because we have gotten such robust funding that was intended to just do that, keep operations running even though the feds know demand is in the tank, they want transit agencies to be running so that the services are attractive and ready when people are ready to come back to the bus. So here we are. Um, so we do feel the need to reinstate some cuts, um, but we'll, let's walk into that, let's dive right in. Um, so we cut 33% of our service in general overall last year, specifically, um, Let's go here. Yeah, this slide's pretty good for that. So we cut all our Saturday services. So that's our, we have two regional routes, the 199 and the 20. 20 is the, the bigger one of the two. We cut those on Saturday as well as all our local service, which is our four Crescent City routes and dial ride. Everything was cut on Saturdays. Uh, we cut the weekdays last hour of uh, the locals in Crescent City and the dial ride. So now we shut down at uh, six o'clock instead of seven. Um, we cut one afternoon trip out of the 199 that goes out to goes through Crescent City, then to Gasky and back. We cut a morning trip uh, of the Route 20 that goes between Crescent City and Arcata. And then we cut the last evening trip to the 20 between Crescent City and Smith River and a, a short term trip from Crescent City to Klamath. So the cuts were substantial on April 6th. It is a year ago today. Can you believe that? Wow. Anyhow, um, so now what do we do? Um, we're recommending um, that we look at reinstating some, but not all of that. So we talked about how the service level we were at before, which was nearing 20,000, it's probably in the 19,000 range, is probably not sustainable for us to meet our capital needs, grow our labor costs a little like we want to, to, to be an employer of choice and to have stability and still deliver all that service. So um, what's the right amount of reinstatement? That's kind of the, uh, you know, the million dollar question. Um, we could take an aggressive restoration approach and bring everything back, a conservative approach and bring nothing back and continue to wait it out or something in between, which is more of what I call a measured approach here, bringing the partial, partially bringing service back of the stuff that is most missed by, by our riders. So that's what we're recommending this year. Um, we, we've done service changes on July 1st, which is clean because it's the start of the fiscal year. It's kind of mid-summer though. Um, we've done service changes in August. Uh, as long as we get the service change done, I think by the time of the school year, because the students are a market we still are determined to, to get to tap into. And we had just started to when the pandemic hit. Um, so we're recommending bringing back the Route 300, which is our student-oriented route that serves Del Norte High School. Uh, plus all the Saturday service that got cut. So what that would do is bring back, it's the, more, the Route 300 operates for about an hour in the morning and an hour or so in the afternoon, taking students to and from the campus. Uh, campus says it could be, we're trying to potentially serve both Crescent Elk and Del Norte High School. Um, reinstate all this, so that's a minor one if you look at the amount of hours, I believe it's in the uh, 500 or so annual range. The Saturday is more robust. That would bring a couple thousand hours back if we just brought that back in. Um, 
I'm not really recommending the 199, which is our worst performing rod. I don't know that we need to run that on Saturday. That's probably, that was an experiment that's probably run its course. Um, and then uh, we're continuing to plan and chew on whether to bring back any of those weekday trips of the 20 and 199. So that would get us back like 3,000 to 4,000 hours, depending on what we do with the uh, regional trips that we're talking about that were taken out last year this time. Uh, a conservative approach, if the board's not comfortable doing that, we could we, we recommend bringing the 300 back for sure now that kids are back in at least partial in-person learning and hopefully in August would be full in-person. I know as a parent of high school kids, these guys need to go back. So anyway, at least we would bring back the 300 and that would be it and then continue to play it close to the vest with the additional service. Um, or an aggressive approach, you know, we could bring back everything we cut that would probably be the most popular with riders, but that risk putting us back where we were before this all happened with being too big for our steady, sustained long-term funding. So, um, and we're not, I'm gonna skip this slide. It talks about the one-time nature of these pandemic funds. Uh, the CARES so Act. Joel, if, if I could you. just interject here on that, on those approaches, when we were back there cutting these routes, I, I remember, that a few of them, it it was pretty easy decision to cut them because there was so so little ridership on on some of them. The the 199 route, the the 20 route uh, during certain hours were having very very low ridership. So I appreciate you giving us the the recommended uh, and conservative and aggressive approaches. I just wanted to be sure and comment so everybody understood that there is certain ridership out there that that we do have people comment on like the the Gasky route uh, during certain hours uh, where people would comment that that it was an important route yet we only had one or two riders uh, utilizing those um, so uh, I'm I'm all in favor of your your recommended approach here um, those, if if my memory serves me correctly, were were the most popular, the the most used uh, routes, and so um, it it seems like it makes perfect sense what you're saying here uh, to uh, to go ahead with uh, reinstating those routes if if we could. That makes sense. Thank you, Darren. No, I, I agree. And the um, I had a. The uh, I had a the, oh, one thing I was going to mention is the 199 does do better in the summer. Um, it was discovered by some folks locally that do group trips out to to the Smith River to do recreation on the water. Um, so in the summer, the 199 does better. So what we might consider, and we'll bring more detail on this like next meeting, is we because we're not asking you to approve a service plan here. We're just talking in high level concept. But um, we might do a seasonal and reinstate the three trips, the third trip a day on the 199, or maybe even the 20 in the summer months when our ridership and there's more tourism, more recreation going on. So that's another option. But yeah, during the winter, the 199 struggles, no question. If everyone that wanted it rode it, we'd be in business. But in transit, that often, that always happens. It seems like people will ask for something, but then the actual demand turns out to be a little less than we thought. Any other questions while we stopped at that point? Okay, well, we'll move ahead. Um, as we talked about, Dan explained very well, the, the, the COVID money is robust, but it is one time. And the way I understand the contracts that are coming through, we have about four years to spend it. So it's gonna be very helpful, no doubt. And we, we gotta be thankful for our, our federal partners definitely connected and uh, saw what was about to happen to transit. More so the agencies that have a high level of commuter ridership where fare box is huge to them. For example, your, your BARTs and your, um, you know, your Seattle King County metros and stuff where those guys are really struggling now because everyone's working from home and they just lost their commuter base. In our case, it's, we're more transit dependent. So our losses are bad, but you know, perhaps not as devastating as some of those agencies with more choice riders that are uh, contributing more fares to the overall budget. So going back to the restoration approach, a partial restoration, if we could bring a package to you guys next month and or in June, that would bring back say three or 4,000 of the 6,000 so or so um, cut hours from last year, that would give us the capacity to set aside some money each year 
from the TDA for our local match and our capital projects and still bring back the best service and most consumed service of what we used to have. Um, and then if things change in the future, as Dan mentioned, transit funding is volatile and the one constant is change. And uh, so if things change in the future and we get a new capital source, then that would be a game changer for us. If there were another Prop 1B or whatever, and there could be, I mean, who knows how the recovery in California is gonna go from this pandemic. But if a new source comes up, then maybe we could get a little bit more aggressive with service in the future. But for now, we recommend, we don't wanna get into a spot where we're you know, uh, institutionally um, underfunding capital because that's devastating. Um, so yeah, so part of that package, just to recap, uh, we would restore Saturday service to the pre-COVID level. And I'll probably bring two options to you guys. Um, Darren might remember this and Vedette, but about three years ago, we created a Saturday level of service that's a little less than the weekdays. And that caused some issues for riders. We, we heard some negative feedback on that. So maybe if we, if we can, maybe we bring back the old, I'll give, give you a couple versions of Saturday to look at. Um, but for sure, Saturday, we, we'd like to reinstate. Um, we need to be, we need to work collaboratively with First Transit because I can, I can see Ben and Fernando looking at me funny on the Zoom because it's going to take some time to, to hire and train the drivers necessary to bring the service back. Because one of the reasons we cut service was not only demand went off the cliff and went in a tank, but we had some drivers that opted out and left. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, we'll need to plan ahead. We may not be able to, it, it may end up being that August is more realistic than July 1st. So we'll, we'll, we'll update you guys on that as we get a little closer, but it's hiring and training drivers takes time. Real quick um, question on the Route 300. Is that only operated during the school year or is that a year-round route? Yeah, it's just school days only during the school year. So it's yeah, it's kind of called a tripper, school tripper in the business. But yeah, it only runs on school days. So for about, for planning time. purposes, we figure a couple hundred days a year. Yeah. Do your more experienced drivers take your longer routes? Oh, that's a good question. Fernando, you want to talk to that? It varies depending on what the driver wants and you know, pretty much everybody does a little bit of everything. That's good. Excellent question. Our, our drivers are not unionized, so they don't have so much of the rigid work rules that you'd find in a union shop. So, um, but yeah, so they have more preference. Some of them like certain routes and some of them are available so many hours a week and others are, they want as many hours as we can give them. So it varies. Thank you. Uh, so next I want, before it's too late, it's getting late and I do apologize. These are so fun that time flies for me anyway. I want to introduce Sylvia Martinez Palacios. Um, Sylvia is a talented marketing specialist that I've worked with for many years. She was with my team at Petaluma Transit before I came up here and she still works with Petaluma Transit. So we're going to get a lot of benefits of, of the stuff she does in the Bay Area marketing wise. Um, a lot of it can easily be recreated and, and help us. So Sylvia, if you're there, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about these next two or three slides are for you? Hi, everyone. Th um, thank you for welcoming me, Joe. You're too kind. Um, so yeah, as Joe mentioned, I used to uh, work with him over at Paloma Transit. I'm still there. Um, so um, our agencies are very similar in that they're very small. Um, right now, Petaluma Transit is being staffed by my manager um, and myself. So, you know, we all do a little bit of everything. Um, and my specialty is in the marketing area as well. So as well as um, handling all the, um, the information that goes out and gets put out in regards to the COVID, um, you know, situation and how to keep riders safe and how to make them feel comfortable about riding our system um, and preparing them for, um, you know, when they come back to the system, when, they, when they're when they feeling more comfortable. Uh, in order to do that, we have to put out the message that, you know, our buses are clean. We're doing everything we can to sterilize them and maintain them in good order so that they feel comfortable in doing so. Um, part of that message is making sure that parents are comfortable putting their kids back on the bus. Um, so we'll be working pretty hard on spreading that message on how uh, all the efforts that the agency is doing in order to make those um, vehicles safe for everyone. Um, 
part of it is through social media, of course. So um, we have uh, created an Instagram account, um, a Twitter account, and a Facebook account. The Facebook account we see more as um, not necessarily a, an essay format, but it is a format for us to reach an older demographic and be able to provide more information on what we're doing. Um, we see the Twitter account as a very short, like two, three sentence snippets about what we're doing. And the Instagram account, we see it targeting the younger population, the population that doesn't really wanna read um, and wants to just look at pictures. So we see that as the account that we're gonna be pushing heavily on for um, the younger demographics. Um, and I'd like to show that, those accounts to you. Um, Joe, do, you, do I need to do anything or can I just start sharing my screen? I think you can give it a try. Yep, I think you can share. Okay. Let's see. I believe. Please let me know if you can see my screen. You should be seeing the Facebook account. Yep. Okay. Great. So this is the Redwood Coast Transit Authority Facebook page. Um, we have here um, some posts. Uh, most recently, the one about Chuck. So um, we went ahead and, you know, are honoring his memory by posting a little blurb about him, about his contribution to the agency. Um, before that, we went ahead and posted an ad about Google Maps. Um, I know that sometimes we forget where our CTA can be found, but um, you can track your vehicle and know um, there is software on the bus to track the vehicle and you can also use Google Maps to plan the trip from start to finish. So we wanted to make sure we communicated that out. Um, let's see, I also wanna show you the Twitter page. So again, we put a little picture of Chuck, um, the, the Google Maps um, info, and we made it into a little video. And then before that, we went ahead and also created another post about the federal law uh, mandate about wearing masks. So it doesn't just mean that you have to wear a mask on the bus, it's also required at bus stops at any transit facility as well. So we went ahead and made that. And then I wanna show you our most recent um, ad on Instagram. So Instagram is something we just created. So we have, um, another picture of Chuck in honor of his memory. So um, we hope that um, these outlets are, are a good way for us to start communicating to different um, demographics of the community. Um, of course, you know, as we, I just started. So um, as you know, I continue in this role, I, I like to see um, a lot of our communications expanded and being able to post a lot of this information and make the website a little more um, active as well and have it be more of a dialogue between the community and the agency as well. So um, we like to give um, the agency a face to the community and not just, you know, um, this is our bus system, but more about, you know, these are people in the community, they serve you, we are here to serve you. So yeah, um, let me go. Let me stop sharing or let's see, stop share. Um, and um, Joe, is there anything else that you would like me to cover? Besides? I think that's it. We're really happy to have Sylvia on board. It, it, it feels a weakness on the lineup for sure. Um, one thing I'll mention every, uh, that's, that's just one month of Sylvia. So, um, <laughs> We're, we're making a lot of progress just in a month. We got Instagram and we got Twitter and we didn't have yeah. those in all those years. I'm um, very impressed with the presentation she had. Yeah, that's, that's what we want to hear. But, uh, that's really we good. had Facebook for a long time, but now it's in a lot better hands. So that's good. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Any questions for Sylvia? Okay, um, we're, we're looking at campaigns and one of the big ones we're gonna work together with Sylvia on is getting the, as she touched on, we're gonna, we need to get market trust in the cleanliness of the buses. That's gonna be huge. So um, we will probably recommend that we use some of our uh, ad revenue program 
some of our, our own bus exteriors to promote ourselves with that. So um, Sylvia will be putting together the creative, the artwork, and then we'll, we'll it'll reduce the ability of us to make money off it because we'll be taking it for ourselves. But I think it's well worth it to try to help our recovery from the pandemic. So that's coming up as well as continued and expanded use of social media. Any questions? Uh, I think that's it. Uh, other, yeah, that's it for the marketing and service uh, restoration um, section. Any question? Maybe a comment. Uh, Sylvia, this is Dan, hi. Uh, just kind of talking about some of these things earlier, uh, we thought it uh, might be a good idea somewhere down the road to uh, go after radio um, PSAs or whatever they'll produce for free um, simply because right now the only radio in this area is running Curry Transit information, but we don't have a steady stream of, uh, of feeding them information that, that way. Also, there was a, a, a field that uh, uh, we could definitely uh, push the uh, 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 the ease of using the bus and the, the good sides of uh, the Google Transit, and I, I was delighted to see that you're already on that. Uh, anyway, yeah, welcome aboard. Thank you. All right, well, we'll wrap up because we have one more item, but we were, we're running late. I know everyone's got plans for tonight. Um, we have been planning last year or so to do a new contract. Our base contract with First Transit was a five-year base with a couple option years, and that started in 2017. So we're in the last year of the base now. So um, what that means is we need to execute an extension or go out for a new base contract. Um, we'd been planning to do the new base contract, but First Transit has approached us. Um, they're putting together an offer for an extension that they think Caltrans can accept. That's one of the issues that um, we forgot to touch on. There's so much. There's so much to touch on with this system in one meeting. But Caltrans, because we're rural, Caltrans has a real strong role in, in what we do. Um, I could say it in a more nasty way, and if you want to get beers some other time, I'll tell you what I really think about it. But Caltrans has a strong role and they have the uh, approval authority over any contracts or extension amendments that we enter into. So um, they have a history of rejecting amendments that increase cost much. They might tolerate a little increase. So um, FIRST knows that, um, I've made that clear to them and they think they can come up with a proposal to extend at a, a zero or very small increase. So I told them, yeah, go ahead. We'd love to entertain that. So by our next meeting, we may have some more information, including perhaps an extension proposal from First Transit. So that's on the horizon. If that doesn't happen this spring or early summer, then we'll, we'll have to proceed with the procurement. Um, that's about it. Um, any questions on the contract? I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say thank you again for the very thorough explanation of things. I do appreciate it. And don't listen to Dan. We like the wordiness. I do. <laughs> Dan hates my presentation. Thank you, Valerie. I appreciate that. Um, okay, that's all for the workshop part of the thing. We have one regular item before we let you go tonight. And it's uh, Dan's item. Uh, if it's okay with uh, uh, Chair Strong, we can go right into item number six. Alessa, is there any further any discussion on the board from the workshop? If Darren's trying to talk, he's on mute. I don't know if he's trying to talk. Joe, do you want me to yeah, walk well, us through? Uh, Thank you, Valerie. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I I pushed the uh, push the button and I didn't unmute myself. Go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry for for interrupting you, but yeah, low or uh, no emission uh, program. Yeah, we've uh, the, the 5339. I won't go over every point in the thing. It, uh, has offered uh, uh, a year of uh, simply funding only uh, electric vehicles, no or low uh, impact on the the uh, 
on the pollution in the air. So we're going for it. We're applying for two vehicles under that, uh, and that will be uh, uh, what we're shooting for here. We've got the application ready to go. We would like your approval on the uh, uh, on the resolution. Uh, basically, we will have to fund um, uh, some of the costs, but it's very interesting. It's only 85 or 80 percent, depending on whether it's for the buses. We also want some chargers and support on it. We may get one bus and not two. We may get, but we may get two or we may get none. At this point, <laughs> it's a, gr a grant application and we hope you'll approve the RESO to submit it. I just have one quick question. You're saying 80% uh, they would be funded and then we would need to come up with 20%? 20%, that's okay. correct. All right, so I'd like to make a motion that we authorize uh, the RCTA to submit a grant application for federal low or no emissions program. I'll second that. Thank you, that, uh, that motion was by Valerie Starkey and the second was Vedette Roberts. Joe, I don't know if you caught that, but is there- it. I'm your secretary today. Oh, Dan. Dan, oh, Dan is okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. And, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna play the role of Nicole. Um, uh, if we're ready to call for the vote on this one, I, if if I'm not mistaken, we have no public. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, I'm aware of I I don't see any public, so public comment is kind of a moot point. So yes, if you would pull the vote, please. Uh, Chairman Short. Yes. Uh, Director um, Starkey. Yes. Director Altman. Yes. Director Roberts. Yes. Director Smith. Yes. Thank you, Eric. Um, so we'll go ahead and submit that application. They're due at the end of the late in the week. Um, I will. Um, I'll, it, we'll work it out there. And if you can maybe print a this page, one page of the reso and sign it and fax that or not fax, uh, scan that and email it to me. That would be great. We'll put it in the packet. We can, uh, we can submit with the, we can submit with the unsigned version, but they, they'll eventually they'll ask for the signature. Um, and that's all I've got for tonight. Um, tentatively, you heard from uh, Autumn Luna, our attorney this earlier, way earlier in the meeting. Um, there may need to be a moving of the Tuesday, May 4th date. Um, <laughs> Does this date work at this point in your calendars? Does it look pretty good for our next meeting? Uh, moving it would, moving it would be fine with me. Um, um, but as a tentative date, it, it works for me. I don't know about the rest of the group. Works for me. May 4th works. is fine. Works for me as well. As as for Tuesday night, I, I personally do have a conflict. It's, it's uh, not a huge deal but if if other people would be amenable to a date change in the future then we can discuss that at a later time i, like I can that. even uh, it's a good point darren i can uh, put that on the agenda because e each year we you know we have board member change and stuff and we've moved this thing around we've met on mondays we've met on fridays we've met on wednesdays wednesdays was killing me remember back when you were on the board yeah. and then we, we moved it to monday or friday because i usually drive in from far away um, so yeah, we can put an item on there to look at other dates or other days of the week. That, that would be, that would be great. So as for now, if uh, nobody has the announcements, we'll adjourn to the tentative next uh, board meeting, May 4th at 515. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Good, Good evening, everyone. everyone.